Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for having me here. Um, I will turn off the Flappy Bird so you won't get distracted. Because I always, that's my high score in real life, actually. Um, <laughs> so who am I? Uh, I am an iOS and Android engineer. I spent four years in Madison, and I moved to San Francisco, and I love visiting here, any excuse I can get. And um, yeah, so I love to be here. Um, and I make iOS and Android apps that are not games. And uh, for my job, but then as a hobby, I make games and stuff. And I just, I wouldn't call myself an enthusiast of games, but um, no, I'm a, I'm a game enthusiast. So, uh, so what does this talk about? Um, so first of all, it's kind of like three mini talks. It's part for business people, part for designers, part for developers. So I'm hoping to make like everybody happy. Um, <laughs> we'll see. I don't know. Uh, so. Uh, I don't have all the answers, but I have what I think are a list of important questions to ask about your app, whether it's a game or not, uh, with context, um, talking about game apps. Uh, and a challenge for future apps in that context. And then I'll get into an example with a, a current game engine. Uh, spoiler alert, it is SpriteKit. Uh, so for the business folks, I just have one slide for you people. So. Hope this is good. Uh, from Distimo's report for 2013, so they're the people that do all the you know, app analytics and business stuff. Um, their uh, sum up was that the vast majority of mobile app revenue in 2013 was generated in the games category. Um, also, that was mostly from in-app purchases. Not every app type, if you're in news or um, you know, productivity or whatnot, you might make your money a different way. But that's how they make their money, mostly, is in-app purchases. Uh, top 10 grossing apps or games, and 75% uh, of US revenue from apps were from the App Store, like iOS. So I'm going to be focusing on iOS. Um, and so now we'll get into like, the design portion. Uh, so by defining, uh, like, to define what is a game, first I'm going to say what is not a game. Uh, so anything where you win or you die, uh, which is a quote from Game of Thrones, uh, is not a game. And you know, like, that should not probably be considered a game. Katniss Everdeen would probably have strong opinions about this, as would Ender Wiggin from Ender's Game. Um, what is not a game? Uh, everything in life is not a game, my mother would often say, because I did not know all the boundaries when I was a kid, you know, and you know, was somewhat mischievous. Mischievous? Mis mischievous. Um, and uh, any sort of thing where the only winning move is not to play, which is another <laughs> quote from an 80s movie. Um, and we'll get back to that. Uh, but actually, I put this up there, and I was like, actually, no, that is a game. Uh, if you can see the tagline, it's really tiny from the movie poster. It, is it a game or is it real, implying that games are not real? Um, so what is a game? Uh, so these are some things that are in games. It doesn't necessarily define it, but there are elements. So there's goals, rules, challenges, interactions. Uh, but it doesn't necessarily define it, you know? Uh, so you know, it's got like pieces or a board, but not all of them do. Some of them are just like cards or whatever. Uh, so, you know, is there a different definition? So Sid Meier, who makes these civilization games that um, get kind of addictive, uh, uh, he says they're a series of meaningful choices. And that sounds pretty general, and that might cover everything. Um, what does that really mean? And then there's this book that I really like. I bought a copy. It's called The Theory of Fun. And I think it's a great book. Uh, it has a lot of like illustrations, which is fun. Um, and kind of adapted and inspired by that book, I have my own working definition, which is games are iconic depictions of patterns in the world, uh, keywords being iconic and patterns. Um, so you can kind of see where this is all, all like, already going with like, app design. Like We use a lot of icons. Pam's talk yesterday was talking about the power of icons and using ones that are understood, and the power of using patterns that uh, people have encountered before or represent real things. Um, so that's what games excel at, is doing that. Uh, so I don't think patternhood is a word, but uh, stages of patternhood, as defined by me, are, there's four of them. The first is noise, and this is what your app looks like when somebody first encounters it. They just have no idea what's going on. You really have to break through just static. You know, nobody knows where any of the buttons are. We don't really know the features of your app at all. Um, they might have read a few reviews or something. Um, but you really have a lot to break through. Uh, that's basically what like design is, I think. I don't know. Uh, and then the next stage is learning. Uh, you know, kids are great at this. The world is their laboratory. Uh, they're always doing experiments and finding out how the world really works and what are the patterns that 
You know, if you drop something, it falls. That's physics, you know, stuff like that. Um, and then you have mastery. You know, when you really have nailed something, you can do backflips and, um, you know, skating on ice and stuff and gold medals. Uh, and then eventually you read the, reach this level of comfort slash boredom. And I put them on the same bullets because they're both just as dangerous, I think, uh, when you're talking about patterns. So it's like if you can do something in your sleep, like that kind of means it's comfort, but it also kind of means you're bored with it and you might just move on. Um, so uh, I just have a quick bunch of like example patterns. Uh, so, you know, spatial and color, this is something you learn when you're a kid, you know, you learn all your colors and you learn that things fit together and whatnot, and two things can't be in the same place. Uh, and if you have a game like Tetris that's devised on this, that's, that's pretty fun, but you're not really like learning anything um, unless you've never <laughs> seen squares before. But uh, <laughs> but an uh, app or a game that would really fail at this would be one where if you choose blue, you'd always win. That would be a pretty broken game, or if you always go to the left, right? So there's ways that even a game like this could be broken. Uh, physics and timing, that's another property of the world. You know, like I said before, there are patterns in the world that, you know, Newton's three laws that, you know, um, will probably happen again. So as you learn them, um, it's worthwhile. So, you know, if you fall down a pit in Mario, you know, that kind of corresponds to if you were to fall down a pit in real life, that would probably hurt. Um, there are things in Mario that don't apply in real life, like you touch a leaf and then you get a raccoon tail and then you fly. So, um, and then ones where, uh, that would not do this well would be just button smashing games, you know, where it's like, I push things faster than you and I win. That would, that would be pretty dumb. Uh, and then there's life and death. Uh, suddenly it gets much more serious. Um, you know, games teach, like, you know, that life has a cycle and uh, death happens. And a game that did this poorly or irresponsibly would say, well, you have infinite lives, there's no consequences. And so what would be the patterns that we're teaching people by designing a game that had like that element in it? Um, and then to kind of extend that, there's warfare games. Um, and to do that poorly would be one where if you always play as one side, you always win, right? Because that would be a weird pattern. That would be a stupid game. You gotta have balance, right? Um, rewards are another game element um, that is like a pattern in the world. When you do things that people like, you can kind of tell that people like you and you can, you know, feel good about yourself. So, you know, medals are a good approximation of having people like what you have done. So, um, to do that poorly, it kind of results in awkward gamification where it's like, ah, oh, click on this a bunch of times and you get a gift certificate to something totally random. Like, it, there's no connection there. You know, there, there's no real pattern that that's reflecting. Uh, it's just trying to, like, create some weird consumer behavior out of you. Um, so that's kind of weird. I mean, it's like, advertisers would say it's successful, but it's still, I, I think it's weird. Um, and also manipulation and like social referencing, um, it, just more terms along the same thing. Uh, another type of pattern that might be reflected, this is The Sims, uh, is like social status and roles, like how should people act uh, in the world? And this starts getting really, you know, weird because now you, you start having like, if you do this irresponsibly, you, should ha you could have misogynistic games or things that are like outdated um, and stereotypical instead of looking forward and saying, this is how you should li like live your life in the future. Um, this is how society should work and this game is trying to teach you that. So this is just like a boring old table that just thumbs up that stuff. Uh, and this is not like, um, you know, comprehensive. There's, there's more, obviously. Um, memory, like poker, I don't know, there's, there's other stuff. So, somebody's taking a picture, so I'll wait until she's done. There you go. Okay, uh, so now we bring it back to your app. Um, you know, you may not be making a game at all, so you must have been like, Psh, I'm not gonna make, you know, Mario or StarCraft or whatever. Um, but it still kind of applies. So at first your app is just noise, and then you wanna use design patterns to kind of break through that noise. Um, and design patterns, you know, you look up, you can, you know, get used to that. Uh, and then you also want to reflect real world patterns, either ones that um, already exist or are comfortable for people or that you want to teach to people. And um, me. ideally, you're going to also have uh, new patterns um, that you're going to introduce throughout your app. Um, and a main thing is to avoid comfort slash boredom. 
you don't want it to be too easy, you don't want it to be too boring, you don't want it to be solvable, and then you've done everything that you can do with that app. Um, an example from that 80s movie I've mentioned earlier, they teach this computer to play tic-tac-toe against itself and just run through all the iterations of tic-tac-toe until it learns, wait, I can just tie all the time and this game is dumb. Um, and so that averts nuclear war. It makes sense in the movie, but, um, uh, and Matthew Broderick's in there somewhere. But that is your user's brain right there, um, like the 1980s computer, that like, they, they are running through your app, looking through all the iterations of all the things they can do. And if they discover that, if they play tic-tac-toe in the right way, and it just locks up, and that's, they've done all the things that they can do, that app is going to be downloaded and used for five minutes and then forgotten. Um, so questions to ask, um, what patterns does my app have? Um, at what stage are they presented? Uh, like, are you, are you expecting your users to be learning them or mastering them? Um, are they presented responsibly? Uh, that kind of goes back to what I was talking about before. Um, and are there any other patterns that it should have? You shouldn't just pack patterns in there um, for no reason, but if you can add more, and it would make sense, and go for it. It might make it more fun and engaging. So uh, we're kind of moving slowly from design to development now. Uh, so what can you do to your app specifically um, to introduce more game elements? You can uh, use one of these game environments. I call them budding because they're still pretty new. Like I was four was when Game Center was uh, introduced, and they're still adding stuff to Google Play game services, which is both iOS and Android. Um, obviously, the iOS one is just iOS, because that's how they roll. Um, leaderboards, achievements, matchmaking, as in like, you know, I want to play and somebody else wants to play across the world and we're going to play against each other now. Um, but this is a question for you all to kind of just like think about what could be added to these? Because uh, those are really like the three main things as far as I'm concerned that those services offer. Um, but what, are, what other like cool game interactions could like a central service from Apple or Google add? I don't know. I don't know. Um, and then there's SpriteKit, uh, which was an Apple framework for iOS 7 and OS X 10.9. Uh, it was introduced at WWDC in 2013, so it's pretty new. And it's integrated into Xcode 5, which I'll show you in like a few minutes. Uh, and it aids 2D animations and physics. So we're not talking 3D here. We're just doing like 2D, you know, Flappy Bird, Mario, stuff like that. Um, and it doesn't require going into OpenGL which for me meant it was not scary because OpenGL was scary for me. So um, hopefully it means it's not scary for you too. Uh, so what is a sprite? What is, a, what is a sprite kit? So I like etymology, I don't know. So I looked it up and it has something to do with spirit, which I thought was kind of cool. And it means something that is like, you know, I think it connects back to my definition of games where it's an iconic representation of a pattern in the real world. Like, uh, iconic, like it's a ghost, it's something that's kind of in your mind that you're kind of projecting, um, but it acts like a real thing. Uh, but in, in computer terms, uh, it's an image or animation integrated into a larger scene, uh, which, could be in, which could be like characters, you know, your little person that walks around, or other moving objects that they run into or whatnot. Um, and SpriteKit has a node structure. So basically, oh, yeah, by the way, everything has an SK in front of it in SpriteKit, so it's like SK this and SK that. Um, so, but anyway, they have a node structure, and it's got a parent-child relationship, so you, know, you just have a node over here, a node over here. If you do something to the parent, the child just kind of follows, so if you move it over here, the child will follow with the same like, relative position. So then we come to the example, so this is like the developer part. Um, so I made, this is Snow Mobile, so, and this is somewhat inspired by uh, the Star Wars. Um, uh, snowfall in the background, and then there will be snow buildup on the little buttons of this little like, menu for this app. That's not a game, it's just an app that has a menu, and we just want to make it like, look fun. Uh, and then it has a title that floats around instead of just like, static, and it'll have lasers orbiting around it. Um, and then choosing one of the options from the menu is going to shoot one of the options, and uh, cause an explosion, which I think is cool. So first things first, what we're going to do is, uh, well, this is what you do a manual project. You import SpriteKit into your project. You create an SK view, which is just like a UI view, which iOS people know, but for everybody else, it's 
a UI view is just a thing that is shown on the screen, and SK view is a type of that. So it's a thing that's shown on the screen that's going to have Sprite Kit stuff going on. Um, and then you have that SK view present a SK scene. And note that the SK scene is one of those SK nodes. So that's, remember, the parent child thing. The SK scene is going to be the parent of like everything. So that's the top level. Um, so I'm going to jump over to Xcode here. So, oh, that's a spoiler alert. Um, so if you were to like make a new project right here, you'd just be like, oh, yeah, I'm going to make a Sprite Kit game. Cool. Uh, I don't know. Uh, and uh, you just like make it, and you've got this. Let's see. And um, is this? Uh, I'll just do it on the simulator. But yeah, like literally just like I just create a new project and then it's gonna say like hello world or something. Uh, once this comes up. Yay, hello world. So that's the Sprite Kid game right there. You know, great. Uh, and then what you can do is you can add our snow in the background. So you just add a new file and then you say, I wanna make a resource. I'm doing an iOS style. And you just do a Sprite Kid particle file. Close to the bottom there. And you have different choices, but obviously I want to do snow. And then create that. And then once you, I want to edit this guy. Okay, yeah, so it's built into Sprite Kit that, or into Xcode that you can edit these things. So if you want relatively few snowflakes, you can just be like, I want one per second, or five, or 10. Going crazy now. Yeah, so that <laughs> that's like Madison. <laughs> uh, but I'm gonna go down to I think is reasonable like 20. That looks pretty good. It's not distractingly weird, but uh, okay. And then now I'm gonna cheat. I'm gonna close this out, and I already have one made from here on out. So I'm totally cheating. But um, so what do we just do? Uh, So we just made Snowfall. It's an SK emitter node, so it emits snow. It emits these actual little sprites. Um, and then you just create it in Xcode 5, as I just did. And then you add it to the parent SK node, which, by the way, was that scene that was created. Um, when you just say, I want to make a sprite kit game, it makes this scene. It does all that stuff. Uh, and then it just like runs until you remove it. So that snow is just going to be there, um, which is cool. And then uh, I also added. Uh, individual snowflakes. Um, so each of these is their own little sprite, like a little white dot, you know, is going to fall down. Uh, they're all exactly the same, uh, as opposed to what you learned about snowflakes. Uh, they're all exactly the same. And uh, they each have a horizontally random starting position. They all start from the top and then fall, right? But we don't want them all on the right or the left, because that's not how snow like, works. You know, we want it to reflect the pattern in the real world. And then you give it a, a <coughs> physics body and let Newton take over. So um, if you don't give it a physics body, it doesn't fall. So that solves that problem. And then uh, it melts after some time and when it leaves the screen. And this is important because um, the sprites actually like stay alive indefinitely until you take them out. So if you don't melt them after a certain amount of time, then they'll stay in memory, uh, which is really cost costly. Um, and then once they fall past the edge of the screen, they're actually still like it's still computing what they're doing and what like physics is happening to them, which is like terrible because more are just being made, and so and then you're not even seeing like things below the screen, um, and that's actually supposed to be a feature, not a bug, because like if you want a game where you can like scroll and then you can scroll back and things are still there, um, that would be useful, but we don't want that. So whenever it leaves the screen, it's like dead. Um, and then the floating title. Um, yeah, so it's SK label node, which is uh, uh, SK, so it's Sprite Kit uh, label. So you have just a word dancing around. Um, and then you just have an SK action, so it's just floating. And so it's just an action. You just say move from here to here, and then just do that over and over. And then you also give that a physics body, except you don't want that to fall, right? You want the title to actually be on the screen um, indefinitely. So you turn off the dynamic Boolean. So there's dynamic, and then there's affected by gravity. Um, and dynamic means it's not going to really do any physics whatsoever. 
uh, other than things hitting it, are going to stick on top of it, which is what we want. We want snow to collect on top of the title. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and do that. So here is, let's see. I changed like the background color and stuff, but here's the snowflakes, right? So there's the, the particle emitter that we made, and then some particles falling down and stuff. Um, and then, uh, okay. And now we should have the title. Yeah. So now we have a little title dancing around. You can see how snow kind of collects and like dances on top of the title for a little bit. Um, until it just falls off. So uh, those are the, like the individual sprites that we made. Um, all right, I'm gonna stop that. Uh, okay, next thing. Okay, so now we add lasers, which is cool. Uh, so these are also sprite nodes. Um, so just like the snowflakes, right, those are just white dots, these are red dots, because lasers are red. Uh, so create and assign uh, flash and orbit SK action. So you know, they're going to be flashing, and then they're also going to be orbiting the title. Um, and they are um, children of the title. So as the title moves and swings around, the orbit is just going to swing as well as they continue to orbit. So it's just nice and smooth, um, which is what that bold says. Uh, so let me skip ahead to that then. And now we should have lasers. There we are. So you can see that they kind of move with the title, right? And they're blinking and stuff, and they're just little red dots. I don't know, they're not fancy. Um, all right. All right, and then uh, now we want to add buttons, right? Because this is a menu. This isn't even a game. You just are choosing what to do next in, um, in your app. So I just added plain old UI buttons. This is buttons, I don't know. And um, then you also add SK nodes like, that are invisible right on top of where the UI buttons are. Uh, and then you give them uh, physics bodies that are non-dynamic so that snow will accumulate on them, right? But they won't fall off. Um, the first time I did that, I, my buttons like, fell off immediately, and that was really weird looking. Uh, and, then you, and you can like, select anything, because they all like, fell. You had to be like, really fast. Um, so well, when you press them, what it's going to do is it's going to remove all the SK actions from the laser nodes, which, remember, was flashing and it was orbiting, so they're just going like, to stop. And then uh, I also have them like, grow in size, because I think that's a cool effect. And then you assign a new SK action, they're going to move to the center of whatever button you press. Um, but then we want it to explode, too. That would be boring if they just moved to a place. So we want the button to explode, because that's what many buttons should do, I think. In, in my like, world, that's what like, everything does. So uh, if you explode the button, um, or in order to do that, what you could do is you actually make use of completion blocks for your SK action. So when an SK action is done, it just says, all right, now do this other thing. Uh, so once the laser's hit, that's the end of the SK action. What do you do then? You remove the button and you add another SK emitter node, which is just like the one that's making the snow, except it's not a making snow, it's making an explosion. Um, but it's the same type of class. And then after an action film worthy period of time, you remove the emitter, so the explosion's done, and you navigate to some other screen. So, let's see. I am skipping six, because, okay. So now it's dancing around. We can press button one, and it shoots button one, and then <laughs> moves to the rest of the app. So, um, and all looks really well, except if you let this run for a little bit, uh, you actually can't see it because of the, the weird like, screen size, but like, it's going to slow down a lot because I just like, added a ton of snow. And so this frame rate is really getting like, demolished. So um, it works, but it really doesn't work, right? I mean, like, okay, now it's just like, totally busted. So, all right, so something's got to be fixed here. So this was actually alluded to uh, yesterday in Greg's talk um, about like frame rate and stuff. Like, he, had, he talked about the game loop. So SpriteKit gives you this little diagram. So basically it just does all these calculations. You don't have to memorize this, but just know that it just goes around and it's supposed to do this 60 times a second. And by the end of that, it was probably doing it about like four or five times a second. So it's like super slow and you really notice. So you always want it to be 59 or 60 really. Um, and so you want to check your frame rate. There's a few ways to do this. You can show this on screen. Uh, using a show FPS property, 
uh, and it actually just prints this out. You want to do this while you're debugging. You wouldn't actually want to do that in the app or you'll confuse everybody. Um, and then as you're running, you, um, in Xcode, they actually tell you CPU memory and FPS. And you can see that like, it kind of ramps up at the very beginning and it turns it blue when it's like, oh, it's less than 60. But then it, it's just 60 after that. And that's actually normal. It actually ramps up all the time. Um, and that's just the debug navigator. You don't have to like, open anything new. It just opens as you're running. Or you can do instruments, which is more powerful, um, in which case, instead of going to build and run, you go to profile, and then you choose the core animation preset. Um, and we're not using core animation, but that's just a preset for the profiler being like, all right, well, look at the things I would care about if I was using core animation. And one of those things is frames per second. And it'll tell you. And you can use like, all the data and export it. So um, somebody can, if, if you're not the main developer, you can just be like, here, I have proof. This is what the frame rate was. And instruments read it, and it was terrible. Um, oh, crap, we're not done yet. Uh, so I fixed that, and it should be on 8. Yes, OK. So this is the same. It's not going to be that exciting after the last one. But this is one where you can just kind of let it go, and it'll be fine. Um, because I, if you notice, there's just like less snow out there. So that was the real problem, is they had to calculate physics for all these objects. And so I just made fewer of them. Um, but yeah, it still remains that you can just choose an option, and they'll shoot it. and move on. And so, you know, it's, it's a menu for some hypothetical app. Uh, okay. And then, so the last thing I want to leave with is, uh, A, there's a lot of exciting research going on around games and learning, you know, like the patterns and all that stuff. Uh, actually, a lot of it happening at UW-Madison. There's a games learning and society group. Uh, Google them, check it out. Uh, and then there's a lot of unexplored patterns for apps. So, um, you know, Every time like, I listen to somebody who's a designer, because I'm a developer and I have no idea what I'm, like you can tell from that app, I, I don't know anything about design. But um, there's a lot of patterns that are explored and there's a lot that aren't yet. Um, and then introducing game dynamics and physics is easy and fun. Like, I, don't, I, I just kind of got really excited about this when Sprite Kit was announced last summer. So um, this is new for me, but uh, I find it to be really fun. So hopefully if you feel like you can experiment with it, after seeing this demo, I'll have that code up, you know, so you can play with it and stuff. So, uh, and that is all I have. So, thank you for listening.